Hey, ciao everyone. Ciao. Ciao Marco, how are you? Fine, thanks. Uh, ciao, ciao Adrian, lovely to see you guys. Nice to see you. Lovely to see you too. Marco, ciao. Nice to meet you, ciao. Ciao, Eugenio, Adrian, very welcome. Thank you. Okay, so uh, it's, it's our 18th talk. Uh, from uh, Fake Authentic Life of the Other series. And um, I am alone today. I bring you the greetings of Steffi, who is working in the office and she cannot join, unfortunately. Uh, but um, it is what it is. And uh, we have the pleasure to, to have a Wednesday session uh, with smart and marvelous guys. Today, uh, we have Marco Cappelletti, Eugenio Tiella, and uh, Comte Meuli, uh, Adrian Comte and uh, Adrian Meuli. I hope the pronunciation is good, guys. <laughs> that's very good. That's perfect. Cool. Um, I will formally introduce you as we are used to do uh, in, in this session. So um, Eugenio uh, will talk as a first. Uh, and then uh, Adrian and Adrian uh, will go second and Marco will conclude uh, this uh, lunch session. So thanking you for uh, taking part to this. Um, Eugenio, uh, Eugenio Tiella uh, is one of the most brilliant, curious and sharp mind we had pleasure to work with. He recently graduated from Indrisio and apart from his very young biological age, his brain uh, run fast and he opens up like a Pandora base, bombarding you with pills of unexpected knowledge that spans from his interest in botanic to sophisticated inventive architectural creations, never forgetting a certain beautiful sense of humanity that we love. Uh, he will be part of our fake authentic exhibition uh, at the Antonia Iannone Gallery in September uh, with this marvelous piece named Colombo with a strange egg that literally switch on lamps on Eugenio's fantastic word. So Eugenio, thanks for joining us and I leave you uh, the word, thanks. Thank you, Luca, and thank you, Stefania, even if she's not here with us. So I will, since we have 20 minutes, I'll share immediately the screen in order to leave space to everybody to speak. Thank you. So can you see my screen? Yes, perfectly. So it will be a mix of uh, me reading and uh, telling a story. S since it's such a complicated process that brought me to this presentation, I will, uh, I will do both. So I hope to not sound too boring at some point. So for Life of the Others today, I decided to tell you a short uh, extract of my experience by collecting a series of objects that I've placed on the on the floor on the carpet of my living room. It is a small two-dimensional uh, wonder camera on which I invite you to sit and uh, which contains personal life experiences arranged in a way to become a short story, a path of direct relationships and unconsciously discovered relationships that together form uh, an interpretation of what can be fake authentic or uh, iconic ironic in my eyes. It is a brainstorming of memories and projects for which you have to be patient if it will not be clear at first sight that sense that unites them and it begins with this comic which I find uh, beautifully ironic. It tells how primitive man made steel pipes, basically. It is a complex and well process that involves humans and animals, starting with the extraction of minerals by means of mammoths that are not too domesticated. Follows the crushing of minerals to obtain iron done literally in a hurry and the fusion with other components to transform the iron ore into steel. The rolling of the incandescent mass reduces the thickness, getting a thin sheet rolled and cut like this primitive worker uh, who got hurt with the sharp edge of the wheel and runs to the foreman. 
Work accidents continue in the first phase of the tube formation. There are several in the process. Maybe you can find them all in the, in the next pages of the comic. The second phase, again, with the help of mammoths. Then the welding, a little controversial with this King Kong style uh, tribute. The finished tube also undergoes availability tests here of pressure, uh, definitely debunking the meaning of the word primitive somehow. It is straightened with an ingenious but always a cynical, let's say, signal system and cleaned, uh, you might say, by hand. Once the work is finished, a package of tubes is made tied together with live snakes. And everything in the end is uh, shipped together, pipes, primitives, snakes, and mammoths. The comic I've just shown you was used by my grandfather, Carlo, as an advertisement for his company, which as you may have guessed, uh, was dealing with steel and more specifically with pipes and machinery for deforming them. This is a card from, his, from, uh, from him when he was 24, so uh, a little younger than how I am now. And that he used at the beginning of his career when he was employed by Tenaris Dalmina. Carlo was a worker, so he had only obtained the eighth grade uh, diploma because the world had stolen an education from him, basically. So in the end, the factory became a school. And this was the manual they gave to employees with all the technical information for uh, uh, needed to, to build the steel elements. So it was a manual that workers had in the factory to, to deal with these this new processes. But it contained also examples of practical application from the simple pilot from power lines to increasingly complex structures that gave a complete vision of the craft, uh, part of a process that ended with impressive works, resulting from a basic element such as the tube. And also of uh, legendary works, uh, such as the Branca Tower by Gioponti in Milan, that I found uh, ironically in this uh, worker manual uh, without even a uh, reference to the architect. By working, observing, understanding, reading, and repeating, at a certain point, Carlo put his personal vision of the industry into, into practice by founding his own company, whose comic I first showed you. He converted the direct experience accumulated over the years into a creative spirit and passion, designing huge machines capable of cold deforming the same pipes that had given him a job in previous years and setting up his own factory as the spirit of the time often led to, to do. So the story of Carlo, which began with a, an ironic comic and become the purest expression of the concept of patient, is completely for me authentic. I told you about the story of my grandfather, ironic and authentic at the same time, because in preparing this presentation, I retraced the project I made as a student, recognizing for the first time a basic element that is precisely the steel pipe. I found it interesting to discover in retrospect that I had somehow continued the process older than myself of architectural research on a simple element, which however contains as my grandfather was already clear, the potential to be much more. I want to briefly talk to you about three of these projects, try to tell myself through them, in order to guess between the lines, the method I apply to introduce myself. For all uh, three, I have collected photos of three models in three different scales, so I will not show you any drawing with the idea that the story leaves more room for uh, imagination. So the first one is this one to 70 model and the scale of it is quite peculiar because it was made during the first pandemic with Atelier Pedrozzi and I was basically trapped in a house of friends that had this huge balcony, almost 100 square meters. And the project was about developing a leisure space. And in my case, 
um, a steel um, steel pipe system that was hanging over a, a street in Palermo, and that was aiming to capture with a net the, the moisture of the air in order to allow a, a beautiful garden to grow underneath it. So in this case, the steel pipe element was a mean of construction, but also a mean to, to look for a, a symbiosis between, uh, between means, between, for example, the people and the streets, but also like you can see in further pictures of the model of animals and architecture, like these spiders were already leaving up the, the structure after a couple of days of deployment. The second project I would like to speak to you briefly about is uh, a project I did for the diploma, and Adrian probably knows it already. Uh, is uh, is basically a structural mm -hmm. model, one to ten, that I realized uh, as a sort of uh, um, real life test of the capability of this uh, steel structure, realized uh, completely by by hand and only by the meaning of the pipe again, by bending, cutting, and um, riveting everything together. This is the structure that is only an element of the complete uh, building that was a, a circle that uh, welcomed a recycling center, a, a place for, uh, for the city of Firmini that was allowing the population to get rid of a very huge landfill just outside the city. So the idea was to, to generate uh, a roof, an architectural element that was able to, to provide these this people with a, a simple, uh, simple intervention of, of the needed elements that were missing in the recycling process. So I spoke about symbiosis in the last, pro, in the last uh, in the last model, and this model is more about reversibility and a circular economy somehow. This was the entire element. And the repetition of these simple elements was generating the roof underneath the life could happen. The third project is the last of the series of the pipes, as, I, as I'm now calling it. And I, I did it during uh, Atelier Doiber during my bachelor. And it was a quite difficult process to, to go with because uh, unconsciously, unconsciously I had this need to experiment with the ready-made of the pipe. But the, um, the master, let's say, I was working with was not really in that orientation somehow. But is anyway a, a structure in Zurich nearby the, the Grain Tower, the, the tallest building of the city, you might know. And it was basically a vertical farm, an experiment to, to find out how society could overcome the, the, the huge environmental crisis that is hitting our uh, production of, uh, of crops, for example, reintroducing a sense of zero kilometer also in a city like Zurich. It's composed again uh, of steel pipes, in this case vertical, that are denser in the lower part and become thinner and more uh, um, rare at the upper floor. And the whole thing stands only by, by the mean of this simple uh, 10 centimeters diameter pipe repeated infinitely in this forest of, uh, of steel. As tradition of the atelier, we had to paint it. And my, my color, a sign color was fleshy pink in this case. And despite all the authenticity of the, of the process I've illustrated you before uh, related to my grandfather, this uh, discovered the relation and the interest in the use of ready-made elements, simple elements to generate architecture that they will define iconic. In this specific case, uh, the professor itself didn't define it iconic, but uh, completely fake, because during the, the final critic, the professor stepped out and just declared that this was not architecture in the, in the close sense of the word. So for me, this is an expression of fake 
And fake, uh, let me to continue the, the presentation because fake authentic iconic ironic are all words that do not belong to objects or constructs but exist only in people's gaze in the personal filters that we apply by observing something that intrigues or disgusts us and which therefore can change over time the fake of today is the authentic of tomorrow and vice versa everything is an innocent manifestation of a free interpretation it is with this free spirit that I start the conclusion by telling after an ironic comic, an authentic story, and a fake project, the process that binds me to Stefania and Luca exhibition. What I love about this event is that is the total freedom of expression in which the participants can play with lightness, the same that I find in everyday objects that allows a fairy tale to be reinterpreted and transformed, which, like the previous experiences I've told you, starts from a personal process coming from the gut. Direct expression of an observation similar to that of Carlo. For example, among the other books from which I draw inspiration, rereading Monari's uh, fables, who imagine stones found on a beach as if they were uh, miniature words and forgotten islands, with a friend Bladert, in a couple of days, we translated the story into a stool, a wooden stone, functional enough to be a tale and a useful everyday object at the same time, reworking a personal memory. For fake authentic, on the other end, I appropriated a memory that, like the university projects, unconsciously drew on the experience of my grandfather, who in addition to pipes, loved collecting absurd objects like this tarantula trapped in raisin, which has become a paperweight, which we would never imagine doing today for obvious reasons. And this natural stone ash trees, heavy objects with bright veins, which betray a superficiality in the use of the material, but which at the same time elevate it to a precious treasure, giving it a long life. Absurdly, they express a sort of involuntary ecological thought, given that, unlike a disposal or fragile ash tree, they have reached the venerable age of 70 years, serving two generations of smokers. They are at the same time beavers of function due to their size and geometry, and of sensation obtained from the firm and cold touch of the stone the pleasant heaviness of the ashtray that waits on the end. The twisted, bright and colorful mineral reflection, which amaze us for reasons we are perhaps not even sure of, which remind us of a complexity enclosed in a small portable object. It is from these experiences that I wanted to design a light switch as uh, Luca introduced before, that was not just a mean to turn on a light bulb, but that tells a story every time it is used. An object freed from conventions, like a child's plate, conceived in one go by mixing various life experiences. And that I recall the, that recall the iconicity of objects as, such as grandfather's hashtags. And with this, I've concluded. I hope it was not too long. And Perfect I hope timing. you missed something because it's really a brainstorming of uh, experiences of memories that are somehow connected. No, thank you, Eugenio, for this brainstorming. It was a beautiful brainstorming, actually. So uh, I think we should call uh, Angela Doiber to, to see the exhibition and, and, and listen to what she thinks about your uh, Colombo. Maybe it's another fake. Maybe you should paint it pink again. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, I think it's uh, the table you, you shared with us, uh, with your memories, both uh, memories and uh, fragments from your backpack. It's really beautiful. And the way you describe it, it's, 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 it's intriguing. And as you are intriguing as a person, I mean, the, the way you explore all the time small fragments and the way you start thinking about unexpected things to me, it's always, it's always amazing. So even Adrian, of course, knows better than me your diploma, uh, but I would like to know more because the, the fragments you showed us are so, so, so 
intriguing and thanks for sharing this with us. We are very much looking forward to, to have you uh, soon in Milano. So thank you, for, thank you Eugenio. And looking uh, forward. <laughs> We, we now go to uh, Comte Meulu, Adrian and Adrian. Um, these guys are a practice based between Zurich and uh, Geneva. Uh, they are architect and as well, they both teach um, Adrian in Mendrisio and Adrian at ETH in uh, Zurich with uh, very cool guys like Muk Petzet and Alexander Terio. Um, as every young practice, they approach almost every architecture uh, in its many nuances. So of course, competition and every kind of scale built and non-built projects, uh, beautiful objects or pieces of furniture. So young and so successful at the same time already. Uh, they have been awarded recently with a um, inclusion in the list of the most promising emerging Swiss practice. And apart from Swiss borders, we would uh, like to include them in the most promising emerging practices in general. Uh, they will also be part of our fake authentic exhibition at the Antonia Janone Gallery in September with a series of strange curious lamps uh, named bent it like it sots that possibly have nothing to do with Snoopy Doopy Dog, uh, rather uh, very much to do with the intelligent and wise exploration of materials and their characteristics, their limits and their possibilities, uh, generating an intriguing and expected built family of shiny insects. Uh, we are more than delighted to have them and we are very much looking forward to uh, host you in Milano, guys. Uh, enjoy uh, your talk and very, very much thank you. You see, hello. <laughs> Do you yeah. see my screen? Yeah. Full. No, it's not full. It's not full. Sorry, unfortunately. <laughs> now, yes. Yeah, now yes, it's very good. Well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Luca and uh, Steph, for organizing these great opportunities to share, I mean, all these thoughts with amazing people, colleagues, uh, and friends. And as you uh, probably more know, than, uh, more, know more than us, uh, the task was not easy, how to define fake, how to define authentic, uh, but maybe more important, um, how to give our opinion, how to share our thoughts about it, more than trying to give a definition. Um, maybe to start, the way we practice architecture is highly linked with narrative. It's about telling stories or inventing stories, considering the narration of the project as part of the architecture itself. We constantly aim to refresh the way we look at what is surrounding us, our everyday, our ordinary, we cultivate our ability to be astonished, to be fascinated for unplanned encounters, for unexpected discoveries, for banal gatherings. What we observe is not the grandiose, nor is it the sublime, neither is it really beautiful. It is characters, scenes, objects, roles, some stitch points which beauty emerges once assembled, when they are brought in relation by the project. We see each project as a derive, provoking new and unexpected situations, conceiving experiences which result cannot be foreseen. So basically, this is our starting point. We like to tell stories, we like to twist narratives. And in this sense, we believe we could have given many interpretation to your fake authentic thematic. So it triggered uh, between us a discussion about what is really authentic in our approach. And in this sense, um, how to act, the way to act, to take action and to take position in the process of a project is probably the most authentic thing to us. How to act and react considering the situation of a context in a very broad sense. But maybe even more authentic are the reasons why you act, the condition that forces you to take position, to take action and reaction. So maybe instead of talking about projects today, we would prefer to talk about some actions and some reactions. 
The first action, and maybe the most basic one, is the act of building. But most of it, most of all, of thinking by building. Seeing the architect as a researcher, building prototypes, experiments. We conceive architecture as we would conceive prototypes, meaning not as a fi finished product, but as a step leading to multiple lectures and interpretations. The design method is to develop the project by trial and error, to think and learn during the production process. We do not aim to reach any final product. We are looking for precision rather than perfection. Moving is not collapsing. Swinging reads do not fall. Through prototyping and testing, this project aims to explore the proper limits of each construction. The production as such is a positive critique of the rule and conventions, reviewing the norms according to the specificity of each situation. Working with tensed elements allowed to reduce sizing of the structure. Tensile system, inflatables, filigree construction coincide with the wish for ephemeral and nomadic architecture. The first task we have defined was to cover a very large area with the least material possible. It turned into a construction which is literally expanding the construction materials through tension and inflation. It's about taking advantage of any used resource, about pushing everything to the limit in order to reach a maximum efficiency. In short, it's when economy is turned into equality. The 200 square meter roof was built in two days and served as a gathering party place for more than 500 architecture students during one week. The construction has been developed to be easily disassembled and transportable within a simple shopping cart. But most of the time, the distance between our own production and the experimentation field or the construction site leads to the necessity to translate the direct action, building, cutting, sewing, painting, into a more abstract system, allowing action and reaction. It is about the reaction of the project to its context. In this case, a very simple action, the extrusion of an old chalet through its long and thin and beautiful garden. By extending the main living space of the existing chalet, resulting into a very long and thin, thin plan of 25 times four meter, incorporating all the functions in one space in the middle of the garden. With such a plan, the goal was to blur the boundaries between inside and outside, between the house and between the garden. By the thinness of the plan, one can literally pick an apple from the kitchen and giving the feeling of meandering through the garden while walking through the house. Once all the windows fully open, the house is almost just like a room in the middle of the garden. So for us, Action and reaction often comes by rethinking the original question. In this case, the question was, what do you really need to make a home? And who knows really how it is going to be used, maybe today or tomorrow, leading to the question of highly flexible spaces and designing spaces open to interpretation. Spaces freed from any structure, allowing many types of uses and changing throughout time. An open structure able to accommodate various usages, able to anticipate the future needs as well as the unpredictable. And we believe that freedom of uses can only come with freedom of interpretation. So with the ability of the project to be personally understood. Last year, we were invited to participate to the competition for redesigning the entrance hall of the um, uh, Kunstmuseum in Winterthur. And to be honest, we didn't find the space itself so problematic. Maybe it was even very fine as it was. By the way, maybe it's why we did not win. But there was a huge unexploited potential. The main entrance of the museum was facing the main avenue, uh, directing uh, in direction to the city. And it seemed that nobody noticed a small door leading to the beautiful park on the back side of the museum. Or at least what was considered the back side of the museum. So the action 
was to open up to really to reveal this very great potential by turning the entrance hall into a public passage from the city to the beautiful garden. So it's a very simple device allowing to open up the museum, not only in a literal, physical way, but also by making it a much more public space. Maybe to continue on the idea of a device allowing to negotiate between conditions, the aim of the project for the House for Everything was to produce something able to accommodate at the same time a home and a much more public space. So activities ranging from a small family dinner to a atelier, to yoga class, to an exhibition space. In the plan, the serving rooms on the back side allows to completely free the main space for any type of uses and on an everyday basis. The, the roof is sought as a device reacting to such an unstable condition. It's a device able to negotiate the different possibilities of uses and activities happening in the main uh, large space of the house. Depending on its tilt, the roof um, produce a range of different conditions for the main hall, from very private to highly open and public. In the case of a project with a very low budget, the question to us was how to produce an exciting situation with only one twist, one twist we could afford. The idea was the placing of a very simple and pragmatic prefabricated volume high above the ground. It's a house above all. It's about taking advantage of everything which is already there, the light, the view. So in short, it's a highly opportunistic action. So if we try to condensate a little bit everything we've said, it's all about the beauty of diffuse conditions. Instead of classifying between fake and authentic, between ironic and iconic, inside and outside, right or wrong, we would like to work in a great system of gradients, of blurriness, where each action triggers multiple personal reactions, multiple subjective understandings. In short, there is no right or wrong, only stuff happening, stuff to react and act with. It's all about taking action. And we would like to conclude with a small video that is making an even more condensed explanation of what we just said. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. A beautiful um, extract, let's say, of the most intriguing uh, production from your side. And we are very much fascinated by that. So, uh, I mean, you, you literally uh, project us into your words. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful word, actually. I, I am a big fan of the these incredible roof of clouds you you did. I, I think it's one of the most uh, beautiful and simple ideas, and it's it's also 
uh, very nice to see this after Eugenius talks, I, I think, also. because in, in Eugenius one, you, you see a kind of a um, student approach, let's say, a very uh, mature student approach uh, with the testing and the, and the, um, the stressing of ideas and the measuring of ideas. And in your case, you see this kind of very similar approach, but then all, all of a sudden these ideas are built and revealed as, a, as an architecture. And I think that's, that's, that's a very linear process. So yes, act and react. Uh, I think it's a marvelous description of your production. So thanks for sharing this with us. Thank you. Thanks, Luca. Okie dokie. Uh, last but not least, we move to Marco. Uh, Marco Cappelletti uh, from, from Italy. Uh, Marco is a photographer who works between Venice, uh, which is his hometown, if I am not wrong, and, and Paris. Um, his picture have been exhibited already in the most important institution for art, like the Venice Biennale, the Triennale here in Milano, uh, the Pavillon uh, de la Reine in Paris, and the Rotterdam Kunsthalle, and such, and such, and such. And apart from photography, he's also involved in teaching since he's a uh, beautiful organizer and lecturer in, in clever workshops. It's curious to know that before photography, you have been studying and practicing in the field of precision mechanics. And that's, that's what that was very much intriguing to me. And that obsession, one could say for precision is of course part of his works. Probably one of the reasons that helped him to become one of the most affirmed architectural photography you can find nowadays. The reason why we invited him is because um, apart from mechanical precision, we find an extreme beautiful humanity and genuinity in every single shot he makes. Humbleness and a domestic background is always revealed in his picture that appears as a sharp, marvelous built painting. So Marco, thanks a million for taking part to this and we leave it to you. Thank you, thank you for the, this uh, generous, uh, very generous introduction and uh, congratulations to, uh, to Adrian and uh, Eugenia for the presentation, amazing works. And uh, it's nice because I, I used to work in the precision mechanic field as Eugenia's father and I uh, used to work in, in a tube, I used to design tube bending machines. So <laughs> very connected uh, to, to the field. <laughs> And um, I shared the screen today. I decided to not to speak a lot about my pictures, but to try to to apply this point of view of um, uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. there we are to try to share these um, to try to the, demonstrate the paradox and uh, applying the fake authentic point of view to a city. Uh, especially to the city of Venice, where I lived for two years. I'm from Como, in, uh, to be honest, uh, so close to Mondrisio too. And um, I tried to demonstrate this paradox so that uh, Venice, as probably other cities in the world, is an image nowadays before being uh, more than being a city. So I start, uh, I try to follow also the, the point that uh, you gave me. I don't know, can you see the presentation? It's full screen. Okay. Uh, full screen, there we are. So I started from uh, Iconic and um, I decided to, to show these uh, Canaletto paintings. Uh, Marco, uh, I apologize to interrupt you. We are still on the uh, slide with Iconic written with no pictures. No picture, okay. No. Now, no. Uh, okay. No, maybe you should go back in sharing the screen. I go back. Uh, I go back without full screen. Maybe it was working before. No. Uh, yes, it works. Okay. I don't know why if I put full screen, but you can see no. Yeah. Okay. I don't know why it doesn't work. So I decided to to show these um, these Canaletto paintings uh, because uh, probably are the uh, used to be one of the. Um, most uh, influent producer of images of, the, uh, of, of images of Venice at the time, and um, this uh, picture I think they are still uh, super iconic of the city of Venice uh, because obviously the city hasn't changed a lot uh, since the moment since the 18th century when they 
when they decided to, to make these beautiful Veritas paintings. And um, I guess they contributed to give uh, with these paintings uh, the uh, contribution to the status of, of icons, both to, this, to the paintings, but also to the city. So the city became a, a, a super iconic because of its representation by images. And uh, Carletto is, uh, of course, a, ma a, ma a master of it. And um, I will come back to him uh, afterwards. Um, I also wanted to, to show something that uh, uh, I like, uh, um, speaking about an icon for Venice, so the concept of Pink Floyd in 15 July 1989. I, I like this image uh, as another one that I will show you be afterwards, because uh, uh, I try interesting, I find interesting the thing that both Pink Floyds and Venice are icons in uh, their own words. So there are two icons facing each other and amplifying themselves uh, uh, all together, making something very, very, very powerful uh, in terms of uh, in terms of icons. The same thing for the Teatro del Mondo of uh, Aldo Rossi. I think uh, that uh, here it's even more clear that, that there are two icons, one facing each other and speaking uh, and speaking with each other and uh, amplifying each other, I think. And um, and this is a, is a cover of a magazine of if you uh, speaking about this and uh, and then I want to show this one because introduce some uh, something that I will speak about me afterwards and um, here they they use the, the city uh, as a simply as a background uh, as an image so here the city is used really as an image as an icon uh, to promote uh, to to promote a product and uh, it's nice I like this I, I, I show this because uh, it's completely not used as a city it's used really as an image it's like an image where they decided to do something on uh, there's no interaction at all there's nothing that uh, it's related to the city in the in this uh, in this image it really it really makes the city an image. And uh, so I thought, what, what if this is all fake? Uh, what if this is a, the, the icon? What is authentic? So I tried to, to look uh, to images on Google Maps. And uh, I tried to, uh, to use Google Maps uh, because uh, it has uh, what Franco Vaccari used to call the technological unconscious. So it's, these are images shot by um, spontaneously, almost spontaneously. spontaneously by a camera, there's no human interaction, there's no one who is shooting, who is designing the point of view. It's just what it was there that moment uh, and it's the camera who decides. And um, what I think is that from this image, which is completely made by a camera in a totally unconscious way, uh, what distinguishes this picture by the Canaletto one is simply the human layer. Doesn't, nothing else changes. The city is the same, the, lay, the, the light is the same, um the perspective is uh, almost the same because uh, even the, the google one is uh, quite high and um so i think that what destroys the iconic uh, uh the iconicity of the city in this picture is just people the for the rest well i can uh, I, I think i took the, the line straight the the bell tower is cut off it's cropped off but Everything it's um, so it could be very very iconic without people, and so and uh, so and this picture I show this picture because it completely destroys the iconicity. Here the iconicity is gone totally because of people. And here again, uh, of course, this is has been used uh, as a, an ironic thing. I'm working only on San Marcos, where I'm just taking this uh, as a. A refrain point of view for a, for a, a discussion that can be applied to many other cities, I think, and to any other images. So here it's quite evident the ironicity. So we have a background super, super, super iconic and uh, and uh, delicate, which is made uh, completely ironic uh, by the the people. So here it's just people who are making this uh, spectacle, these are works. This is uh, from 1989 and, and 
it's part of uh, the first uh, series mold world and this is from 2005 but it's uh, together uh, always from the small world project then i passed to the fake iconic so uh, here is a quite a literal example so this uh, bell tower has been uh, rebuilt uh, in the uh, early ninth, uh, in the, in 19 uh, 15 because it fell down in nine in one and 1902 uh, the reason are not well known but uh, it's uh, in, it's incredible that um, because we should think that now the icon the iconicity of this square is should should be completely destroyed by this uh, by by this destruction of the bell tower and uh, it's it's super nice uh, uh, that uh, I, I mean it's not super nice but it's super strange that um, rebuilding uh, with a, a political decision of where it was uh, as it was uh, the icons uh, resurrect somehow some uh, and resurrect uh, uh, as an image as the very first uh, act and these are post. Uh, stamps uh, that have uh, been made uh, to celebrate the reconstruction and they exactly write where it was as it, as it was where it was um, which can be translated in uh, here is the fake authentic <laughs> super uh, and uh, ready to be sold of course and um, then another the, the, the icon uh, another fake iconic uh, dimension is uh, the marketing the objects that are made uh, with the, these images again and not with the city with these images and it's super nice that uh, we can have it uh, uh, speaking about the the bell tower both for the old version and for the new version nothing changes the icon is uh, always the same and um, I like this and another dimension another fake iconic dimension is the 3D reproduction of uh, of the square, and uh, that used uh, it's, it has been used in video games. Uh, this one is Tomb Raider two. This one is Gran Turismo four. So, and then there's the opposite. So PlayStation used the, the square again as Coca Cola did uh, for uh, during the lockdown. This is super recent. This is from uh, 2020. During the lockdown, they use the square uh, as a as a set to just to turn uh, to, to to record the video promotional video for PS5 launch, and uh, so this is uh, incredible because from being a, a background for a video game, it becomes the, the reality. It, it's used to promote video games, and. Uh, I like this as the Coca-Cola one because uh, it completely uses the image of the city instead of the city. And uh, it's nice that they wrote the play as no limits, <laughs> something very connected to, to what I'm saying, I think. And, uh, and then, of course, I put this because it's, uh, I think it's not. Uh, there's this desire of placing cars uh, in San Marco Square. <laughs> And then uh, a good fake authentic, finally. And this is a picture from uh, the project uh, in Scala, which means in scaling in English uh, by Luigi Pieri from 1978. And um, this is a, a park uh, where uh, the most important monuments in Italy are uh, rebuilt in scale and uh, he, phot he photographed it. And uh, so again, we have this uh, icon. Uh, reproducing as a fake in an infinite loop, in an infinite loop. So fake, what is fake? Getting back to what I said uh, before, uh, the only difference be between a Google Maps uh, uh, image and a Canaletto uh, painting uh, is the presence of people. So I, it's, a, my, it's an opinion, mine, of course. Uh, so, um, I think this is super fake because Venice is one of the most visited city in, uh, in, in the world. And it's always, always, always super, super full of people. So mm, 
showing it uh, empty. Uh, it's really proposing a, a fake and building uh, as production producer of images. And any one of us is nowadays a producer of images with cameras and smartphone. Um, it's really uh, the building of a collective imagery of uh, this uh, beautiful, romantic, uh, full of history, secret city um, uh, that builds a, a really fake history about, uh, about the city. And this is what uh, we can find uh, almost everywhere if you find a Google Images. Uh, this is a website uh, I try to, to look on uh, travel websites. Uh, this is from China and uh, I like this. <laughs> Because as many others, is not the only one, uh, but treats the the, the 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 we play has no limits. We read before uh, in the PlayStation uh, advertisement, and here they this, they it's translated from Chinese, but they say how to play Chinese name Piazza San Marco attraction text uh, wonders romantic outdoor family nature, and uh, open all day no tickets required. And the three images that we see are an iconic images. An iconic image, an empty image of the of the square, and a canaletto. <laughs> so everything comes back. And this is what we can find on Google Images if you try to write travel to Venice. So an empty city. This is what we can find if you find if you look for summer square, but after the first lockdown in Italy. And this is interesting because the void that has uh, that used to be a super uh, value. Uh, it used to be the, the most important thing to show somehow. It, it has become a problem. Now that's from Proronius. Now the void is uh, something negative. And, uh, I like this, uh, this um, representation of the same thing that changes completely it's a sim it's a significance. In just uh, changing words and uh, caption and, and um, I show my fake authentic, which is a picture which is actually displayed in uh, the Venice Biennale uh, in the Arsenal venue. And, um, and this uh, is somehow the picture that uh, made me start to, to the war reflection that I did uh, until now. And uh, it has been shot during the lockdown uh, in uh, April uh, 2020. And uh, it's it has been conceived as a critic, as a as a, a reproduction of a reproduction of a romantic vision of the city, uh, and it is uh, conceived to be shown in a series to do not uh, create this uh, postcard effect. And um, but the, the a problem came up when I decided to publish it on Instagram, because uh, Instagram uh, works with tags, so everything can be watched uh, as a single element. Uh, and uh, not in Siri, in, uh, not in something like that. So it could have been uh, an addition to these uh, infinite catalogs of beautiful pictures of, of Venice. Uh, so another fake representation of Venice, and this is, uh, I wanted to completely to avoid it. So I decided to simply blur it to, to see it's there, but you cannot see it like this. It's wrong to see it like this. And this is um, just some picture from the exhibition, which is part of the City to Dust exhibition from Studio LA from Amsterdam uh, and Bucky Fanning, who built uh, an exhibition, an installation who speaks to about Venice. They built this terrazzo tiles uh, floor uh, representing the city of Venice, which was like this at the beginning, uh, and uh, breaks with people working on. Uh, as a symbol of uh, the destruction that everyone of us uh, do uh, visiting Venice uh, in mass, of course, not uh, visiting in a, in, a, in a good way. So I came up to the, discuss, to the conclusion that somehow fake is destroying authentic here in the city. Uh, it's a new team inspector to the, to the one, and I try to demonstrate that fake is destroying authentic, uh, uh, showing some number, some graphic. Um, this is the number of tourists in millions, so five millions, five, uh, five thousand or two hundred, uh, sorry, <laughs> five, five million and a half tourists, which means uh, 108 tourists per resident uh, in a year. This is a graph that shows the falling of population from uh, the 16th century to nowadays. Nowadays, we are below uh, 51,000 people. 
and uh, this happened in the last uh, 60 years uh, and the city has uh, 1,600 years now. And this is uh, the map of the um, Airbnbs uh, in the city. So, um, and Airbnbs uh, is uh, completely based on images and uh, on the big data and uh, on uh, this kind of uh, representation of the city uh, that creates this uh, terrible situation as a cancer that you can see here. Mm -hmm. I would like to to close with uh, some phrase that I usually hear uh, when I when I walk around the street, and uh, this is uh, somehow a demonstration that the city is not anymore a city. If somehow ask me speaking about the city when it closes, where are the restaurants? Where is the center? And where is the exit? I think this is a, a big demonstration of uh, uh, what I was trying to demonstrate of my paradox. And I would like to close with this uh, amazing uh, phrase, uh, sentence from uh, Venezia, Venezia Muore, Venice Dice from Salvatore Settis, uh, who say, with, uh, uh, looking around and surrendering ourselves to the beauty of our cities or, or, and of our landscapes cannot suffice. It's a, it is never sufficient. Beauty can save anyone or anything if we don't first know how to save beauty. I finished. I don't know how much time it took. <laughs> I hope you are not too sad about this. And uh, I know it's a uh... not at all, not at all. I mean, <laughs> it was really beautiful and 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 very sharp. I think uh, taking in account Venice talking about fake, authentic, iconic, and ironic. In fact, what's more fake? authentic, iconic, and ironic of tennis itself. I think it's a very, very sharp idea. And thanks for sharing such a beautiful, unexpected, and unknown pictures, like the, the, the San Marco bell towers uh, uh, when it was destroyed. To me, it was shocking. I mean, uh, I never saw that picture. Thanks for, for sharing that. It's a beautiful, uh, um, and as well, the Canaletto's view, uh, beautiful um, contribution from your side. So. Uh, I would propose for the, for the most iconic piece, what if the um, Pink Floyd would play in the Aldo Rossi theaters in front of some... Oh. You should make uh, explode Venice in that way. That's, no, I mean, it's uh, apart from joke, I think you took it seriously and the way you treat some very crucial aspect of, of, of Venice, which of course is related very much to tourism, it's something. At the same time, I, I think that's in a way uh, visiting Venice uh, with no tourists, like it happened to us recently when we went to the opening of the Biennale. Um, it's something very strange. You don't know anymore if it's fake or authentic Venice with or without tourists. So I forgot to say one thing, the name yeah. of the project uh, <laughs> with the pictures, which is uh, SWOT, which is a uh, SWOT is a marketing analysis strategy. Uh, to study the impact of uh, long-term strategies on a, on a project, on a city it's used in marketing. It can be applied to a city. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think here in Venice, uh, we, we don't have a long-term strategy. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This could be a solution, I think. No, it's, it's very interesting. Thank you, Marco. So much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we formally conclude the, the session thanking you all guys. So Eugenio, Adrian, Adrian and Marco, thanks a million for taking part in that and to spend your lunch time with us. And we invite you to the next one, uh, which is going to happen this Friday. And we are going to have a four um, guest session with uh, Welly Steinman uh, from Linea 33, uh, Sara Bozzini, uh, Eva Collective, and Margherita Pincioni. And we thanks a million again and looking forward to meet you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. Ciao. Ciao. Thank you so much. Grazie.